I have to say there's something really beautiful about children being woven into our community. Very often they set a room aside or a space for kids to play, which is great and fun for the kids. But I think it's also a good reminder for us that we are a multi-generational community and that all of us need to be sharing this time together. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, Christine. Okay, so um, just arriving and settling in a little bit is uh, Christine Hong. Woo! Yay! <laughs> I don't know how many of you heard her last year. Amazing. So Christine is an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz specializing in transnational Asian American Korean diaspora and critical Pacific Rim studies. How's that? <laughs> She's also co-editor of the Critical Asian Studies Special Edition on North Korean Human Rights. She's a member of the National Campaign to End the Korean War, the Korea Policy Institute, and the Alliance of Scholars Concerned About Korea, and the Working Group on Peace and Demilitarization in Asia and the Pacific. Please, let's welcome warmly Christine Hong. I mean, this is such a different time from last year, and we live right now in very curious times. Last year when we convened here, there was one phrase that hung really heavily on the air, and that was, fire and fury like the world has never seen. And this was like an ominous specter um, from U.S. wars past and future. We understood that Trump's threat against North Korea referenced obliquely the U.S. inflicted atomic holocaust on Japan. And we also understood that it portended unimaginable apocalypse to come in North Korea. And during those dark days, let's not forget, and strange Levian nut jobs like Lindsey Graham went on national media selling the fiction that nuclear apocalypse over there in North Korea would somehow be containable over there. I want us also to recall, though, that Trump's maximum pressure policy was a continuation of Obama and Hillary Clinton's maximum pressure policy toward North Korea. We're in a different moment right now. Peace in Korea has appeared amazingly, amazingly as a prospect on the horizon. Why? Because of two things, I'm going to say it. It's because of the two Koreas coming together. Before people start writing in Donald Trump as a candidate for the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize, let's recall that the two Koreas came together. And the unfortunate truth is also that North Korea developed a nuclear deterrent. So that's what defines this current moment. The crucial issue in this moment is not just whether or not the United States and North Korea have the same understanding of denuclearization. And let's keep in mind that up until recently, North Korea's understanding of denuclearization was a global concept that implied a commensurate obligation on the part of imperial powers like the United States to denuclearize. Yes. The other critical question is whether the world's greatest purveyor of military violence, and I'm borrowing this phrase from Martin Luther King Jr., and a country, North Korea, that has survived being in the crosshairs of the U.S. war machine since the moment of its founding in the middle part of the 20th century, whether or not these two countries have the same understanding of peace. It's not just denuclearization that's on the table, it's peace. In April of this year, Donald Trump live tweeted the Panmunjom joint declaration between the two leaders of the Koreas. 
Korean War to end, the United States and all of its great people should be very proud of what is now taking place in Korea. I want to make a few comments about this. What does this welcome shift in tone, in practical terms, mean? Was it premature for the entire world, which was previously hovering on the edge of the abyss, to stand up in a single voice cheer? Optimistic, yet mystifying, this tweet nowhere seemed to grasp not just the centrality, but also the criminality of the U.S. role in an unending war of aggression on the Korean Peninsula. This was a remarkably dirty war of anti-communist counterinsurgency that was called a police action at the time. And indeed, it was a manifestation of US police and war power that was trained on the peasant armies of North Korea and China, but which laid the entirety of North Korea and vast swaths of South Korea to waste. So in order to make peace, we have to know history. We cannot be assured that Donald Trump understands history. <laughs> the United States perpetrated a bombing holocaust against the Korean people. Is this something to be proud of? This was a war in which an estimated 4 million, some people say 5 million, but of course we don't even know the numbers over there. Why? Because those lives don't matter, right? Four to five million Koreans were killed, 70% of whom were civilians. And I want to say something that's pertinent to these times. That war ensured that one in three Korean families was separated. We're not talking a separation of a number of months that we're contending with right now with the U.S.-Mexico border and border crossings. We're talking about a separation that yawns over seven decades. The other thing that happened was hundreds of thousands of Koreans were transformed into refugees. This was a war in which Truman explicitly used sanctions as part of his war policy. That's still a part of the maximum pressure policy, which we have to understand as a policy of continuing warfare. It's absolutely unacceptable in a time when the US is supposedly entering into dialogue with North Korea. During this war, during the hot fighting period and thereafter, the United States actively contemplated using nuclear weapons. In fact, General Douglas MacArthur wanted to create between China and North Korea a zone of cobalt where no life could live for up to 100 years. That was what he contemplated. Since that time, the United States has threatened North Korea with nuclear annihilation on multiple occasions leading up to the Obama period. So this is the fact of the matter. The Korean War has never been concluded with a peace treaty. And there are only three powers that signed. So Donald Trump in live tweeting the Panmunjom Declaration made it seem as though the two leaders of the Koreas could somehow negotiate peace. That's not true at all. The three signatories to the Armistice Agreement were North Korea, China, and the United States. According to this document in 1953, those three signatories were supposed to return to the negotiating table within three months' time and hammer out a peace agreement. The other thing that they were supposed to do, the two foreign powers, China and the United States, they were supposed to remove their forces from the peninsula within a reasonable amount of time, and they also agreed never to introduce new weapons onto the Korean Peninsula. The fact is, is that the United States, up through the end of the Cold War, stationed nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. The other thing, too, is to this day, the United States maintains approximately 30,000 military forces south of the Demon Sea, operating approximately 80 military installations. In times of heightened war crisis, the South Korean military is not its own. It's under the command control of the United States. According to a series of mutual defense treaties, the United States can use at whim and at will any South Korean military installation. South Korea is a semi-sovereign country at best. I want to recall something. It cannot, I want to say this, 
South Korea cannot conclude peace with North Korea on its own. It takes the United States. The relationship between the Koreas has always been triangulated with the United States. 75 years ago, the Allied powers met in Cairo, and they, they created a perverse roadmap for the post-war peace that specified that in due course, Korea shall be free and independent. To this day, Korea is still not free and independent. We should recognize that peace on the Korean Peninsula is the desire of the Korean people, not just the North Koreans. The South Koreans, the South Koreans, just, the South Koreans elected a leader, Moon Jae-in. They ousted, they took to the streets in millions to oust the previous South Korean president. And they put in her place a democratically elected leader who was deputized by them to negotiate for peace with North Korea. Moon Jae-in's pro-North Korea, like his pro-engagement policy, commanded an 85% approval rating of the South Korean people. And I'm saying this right now, why? Because we see the bipartisan war party rearing its ugly head. And at a time when the Koreas are talking about peace, the United States is still playing an interventionist role. Congress has stated that the president, the United, that Trump cannot withdraw U.S. forces from the Korean Peninsula without congressional authorization. I have to say something to this bipartisan war party that pledges allegiance to the military industrial complex. Get out of the way of the Korean people. I'm gonna say one last thing in closing, and I want you just to know this. We are talking today, and there's so many stories in the media about separated families. I want to share two short stories with you. One is a story of my grand, one of my grandmother's best friends. We called her Mary Ann. She came from North Korea originally. Mary Ann had a fatal talent. She could speak English almost perfectly. And what happened was, when the U.S. forces in 1950 pushed on North, they discovered through people in her town in North Korea that she could speak English perfectly. They commandeered her services so that she could translate for the U.S. Army. She had three babies at home. By the time they were south of the DMZ, the U.S. forces, they had promised her that she could return to her family. They said, if you return now, you're dead. You've been helping the U.S. military. She eventually immigrated to the United States. She was never reunited with her children. Never. Never. A couple of years ago, as part of the Legacies of the Korean War project, a number of us who were part of that project, we interviewed a man who is a Christian minister in Southern California. His name is Dok Jung Won. And what happened was he spoke about being part of what Koreans called Isan Kajok. We have a word for it, separated family, and we understand that there's a world of tragedy in those terms. When he was a small boy from North Korea, he was part of a refugee column that went down south. And he spoke about how in those like heated days of battle, all these people who were fleeing down south would call out to their family members, mother, father, sister, and that near the end when they had been rocking for over 30 days, there was total silence. When we interviewed him, even though he's an elderly man now, I could see a little boy in his face. He had been separated from his mother for almost the entirety of his life. In the United States, there are over 100,000 Korean Americans, you probably know some, and you're talking to one too, who have family members in the North, and this Hostile U.S. policy has made it impossible for us to have any kind of connection with those family members. And I say it right now, we need a people's movement, which has never existed, for peace with North Korea. And you have to support that with me. And you have to realize there are people in your community who have been part of these separated families for over seven decades. Thank you.